Good morning and afternoon. This is Megan Raymond with WCET. Thanks so much for joining us today to the Bringing a Campus Experience to Online Students webcast. First, I'd like to thank Blackboard Collaborate for making this platform available. If you have any technical issues, you'll need to contact Blackboard directly, and I'll go ahead and put that number in the chat box. The speakers today are the only ones that have access to the microphone. So if you have questions, comments, or resources you'd like to share, go ahead and put them in the chat box, and I'll be moderating that as we go along. I'll also send out any responses to questions we don't get to today, a link to the archive, and the PowerPoint slides next week. We'll post those to our website within one week. We have two wonderful speakers today. This presentation was actually presented at the WCET annual meeting in November in Denver, and it was one of the highest rated and common commented on sessions, so we're pleased to have it presented to a broader audience here today. Our first presenters are Katie Imony. She's the Orientation Specialist at Northern Virginia Community College's ELI, or Extended Learning Institute program, where she plays an integral role in creating, implementing, and assessing the online orientation program for new online learning students at NOVA. Katie also assists in coordinating social media outreach, outreach and student life programs for Eli. Dr. Preston Davis is responsible for learning and technology resources and services through NOVA's Eli online unit. Preston also leads the Open Educational Resources Initiative at NOVA, manages social media for Eli, and teaches philosophy courses when he has time. He is an executive board member of the Community College Consortium for OER Resources and chairs the NOVA testing committee. His extensive higher education experience as a faculty, program manager, dean director, and consultant. And I do want to mention that Patricia James, who many of you know, she's formerly with Mount Jacinto College in California and is now a WCET fellow. She was eager to moderate this presentation today, but is having power issues. Her whole part of California is without power. So I anticipated that we may have had some challenges today with weather, but it wasn't the Californian I expected. Without further ado, I'd like to pass it along to our next presenter. And as I mentioned, add your questions and answers to the, to the chat box. <clears throat> Please welcome Katie. Yes, hi. Uh, good morning and afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Preston Davis. And um, we also have uh, Katie Imany here. And we're very happy to have the opportunity to talk to you all today about how we at NOVA uh, work hard to bring a campus uh, environment to our online students. And I know that there are many institutions that are doing very creative things. Um, and so some of what we say may not be new to you. Some of it may be. And we hope that uh, it'll be something worthwhile to discuss. And, and we would certainly welcome opportunities at the end uh, for questions, but also for other us to share some creative things that they might be doing that might be beneficial to the audience as a whole. So we're going to talk briefly about uh, NOVA and, and what the Extended Learning Institute is and does, uh, our online orientation program, how we engage students in the classroom when they are taking online courses. Uh, but really, the, the main crux of this is going to be uh, how we reach out to students through co-curricular activities and social media as well. So NOVA's Extended Learning Institute is the online unit of the college, and we serve about 25,000 students online. Uh, Northern Virginia Community College is a very large community college just outside of Washington, D.C., for those who are not familiar with where we are located. Uh, we have six physical campuses as well as our online unit. Um, and we really work hard to provide our students with the same level of uh, activities and engagement as the students who attend uh, the campuses because uh, a good number of our students take their courses solely online. Um, and we want to make sure that we are offering them an experience that goes beyond just interacting with their faculty in the online classroom. So 
<clears throat> the Extended Learning Institute was established in 1975, and we offer more than 400 courses online. Uh, we offer courses in multiple lengths, so we have 8, 12, and 16 week sessions during the course of the semester. Um, and again, you know, over 26,000 students uh, last year took courses online through NOVA's Extended Learning Institute. We offer over 40 uh, degree and certificate programs, and we just started uh, a general education certificate program that allows students to complete an entire certificate taking courses that use open educational resources so that they do not have to purchase their textbooks. So I'm going to turn it over to Katie, and she's going to talk a little bit about the comprehensive orientation program that we have here at NOVA. Great. Thanks, Preston. So my name is Katie, and I run the orientation program at UI. And students who are new to online learning are encouraged to participate in the ELI orientation. However, it's not required for them to start their course. The ELI orientation is a one-hour webinar that students can participate in from home. We use Blackboard Collaborate for the live sessions, and the agenda includes an overview of Blackboard, student services, testing, critical deadlines, tips for success, and contact information. Over the past three years, we've seen a large growth in the students self-selecting into the live sessions. But over the last two semesters, we've really seen a growth in the percentage of participation. In the past, we've had about a 50% rate of students who sign up and then actually attend. But over the past two semesters, so fall and then just this past month of the spring semester, um, the rate has grown to about 65% of students who sign up and then actually attending the session. And I've also seen a growth in students who sign up and don't attend, but then actually follow up to see what they've missed. So either before the session, letting me know that they're not going to be able to make it, or um, after the session, letting me know that they missed it and requesting a, re a recording. Um, so I'm able to provide them with a copy of the recording. So whether they had technical issues and weren't able to attend, or just something came up and they weren't able to attend. We want to set students up for success. And the worst thing is for students to hit a roadblock with the first thing they try to do for their course, or in some cases, before their class even starts. We use Collaborate for the live session, so which you know requires a few downloads to update Java or other programs. And some of our students use library computers or computers that they don't have the admin rights to. And so they're not able to update, their, um, update the program and therefore not able to log into the live se session. So talk about frustration for these students. Um, the students are already a little nervous about getting started in their online course, and now they can't access the live session. Since we use Collaborate for the live sessions, we do record the sessions right in Collaborate. And I send out a follow-up to students so they can review anything that they missed or if they want to go back and um, get more information about something, they can review anything. But going back to that student who wasn't able to get into the session because of technical problems. So they try to log in early. They do everything that they can to get in. They're just not able to. Um, so they couldn't access the live session in Collaborate, so therefore they're not able to um, access the recording. So we've created YouTube links, so broken the session in two parts, so that students who aren't able to join can go back and watch those YouTube links. Um, so whether it was a technical issue, they have all that information there. Or if something just came up, it's an easier way for us to track um, who's watching the videos and, and how they can view them. So the only thing that the recordings are missing is that connection piece. They aren't able to ask the real-time questions, and they aren't able to connect with their peers on chat. So we do have a live chat that's available for students. This is a real-time chat option for students to get questions answered. So this works hand-in-hand -hand with our orientation program. So if they're watching the recording from home, they can access the live chat and ask any questions that they might have um, after the session is over or if they wanted to go into more detail about something. Um, this is a 24-7 chat that they can use. So if they watch the recording in the evening, they're still able to get that live interaction with a staff member and they wouldn't have to wait for um, somebody to email them back or a phone call during um, while I'm in the office or something like that. Um, the, the chat is available 24-7 and it's available to students, but it's also available to faculty, college staff, as well as prospective students.
Um, the chat goes beyond orientation in the fact that it's available for everyone, but it does work hand in hand with the orientation recording so students don't have to wait to get those questions answered. And now Preston's going to talk a little bit about the engagement in the online class piece. Great, thank you. Um, and I am happy to continue on, but if there are some specific questions about orientation that um, we, you think we should address before we move to the next section, I'd be happy to do that as well. So I'll, I'll leave that up to the moderators to, to decide what might work best. Preston, let's go ahead and continue and we'll get to those in the latter part of the session and collecting them as we go along. Great, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so when we talk about engagement and bringing a campus experience to students, it's important to also include their experience in the class itself. And so we want to make sure that students who are taking courses through NOVA are having an opportunity to engage in various types of activities within their online class. And so we have an instructional design team that follows the Quality Matters um, delivery method for online education so that we make sure that there are engaging activities that involve different types and levels of engagement with students and faculty so that we are able to uh, give them an experience of being in an interactive classroom. We know that online students oftentimes are, are taking courses for, for, the, for various reasons and one of the things that they often miss is the opportunity to uh, interact with and learn from their peers as well as from the faculty member. And so we want to encourage faculty to have the opportunity for students to interact with one another and build relationships with online students in the same manner that they would if they were sitting next to someone in a classroom on one of our campuses. And so we have different types of things that we do. One of the things that we do is we have an embedded librarian program. Um, we have a couple of uh, online librarians, and the, they are able to actually work with faculty and embed in the classroom so that they can be available during specific units to answer questions live that students may have regarding information literacy or research, things of that nature. Or they can have the opportunity to submit questions that are answered within a 24-hour window in some courses. So it really depends on the course and, and, and the faculty member and, and how that is set up. But we want to make sure that students who are online who may not have the opportunity to go to a library as often as they would like uh, still have access to those very valuable resources. Um, and so we have library instruction that we deliver webinars and other types of things that do assist in making sure that students understand information literacy and are able to find appropriate uh, resources for assignments that they may have in the class. And we have a blog series relating to information literacy too. So a number of things that we are doing um, to assist the faculty members in making sure that students have all of the tools that they need uh, to be successful in the class. And so I wanted to briefly talk about open educational resources simply because we find that that is an engagement piece when all students in a class are all given the same access to the course materials, then all of those students are able to function and interact equally within the classroom setting. And so we know from our experience that in, in many courses there may be 20 or 30 percent of the students who do not purchase the textbook maybe because they can't afford it or, or for whatever reason. And those students are automatically at a disadvantage in being successful in the course and being able to keep up with assignments and, and, and interact uh, effectively with their colleagues in the class when they're talking about um, different topics. So we wanted to create an opportunity for some of our uh, general education courses that are high enrollment courses to do away with the textbook, provide all of the resources to students actually through the online class, and make sure that everyone had equal access. And it's worked out very well. Um, we just looked at the report. I just got a report on the, the bookstore um, revenue from the fall semester, 
and it was down over two hundred thousand dollars from fall a year ago. And this program was the major reason for that. And so by in one semester, the first semester that we have offered these courses, saving students two hundred thousand dollars, that is a way to ensure that those students are who may be struggling financially are able to continue and have a better chance of being successful in the courses. And so we see that as, as an important way to, to be proactive in engaging with our students. And so we're going to talk a little bit now about co-curricular online engagement. And Katie and I will be discussing some different things. But she's been very instrumental in making sure that we have opportunities to do different things with our students. And it's been very successful. Katie. Okay, so our goal with the Student Life and Co-Curricular Program is for students to make connections with each other as well as with faculty and with staff. A lot of students we work with are nervous about the unknown of online learning. They haven't started yet or they're just getting started and they aren't sure what to expect. The opportunity to meet fellow students who are new or have taken some classes already really helps calm their nerves. We have a large amount of local students, but we also have some students who are continuing their courses but are out of the area for their course. Orientation has been a great start for this because we use the chat option in Blackboard Collaborate to, um, to help start those connections. We encourage students to log in early so they're ready to go when we start. We cover a lot of information in the hour session and we want to make sure we can start on time. So we encourage them to log in early. And once they're in the session and test their audio, um, we kind of start engaging them in some conversations just amongst themselves. Sometimes we start the chat by asking what classes they're enrolled in, um, if this is their first time taking an online course. Um, but oftentimes through those starter questions, we'll get people kind of getting the conversation going. We'll get some chatty students who um, can kind of keep the conversation going and making those connections for um, what classes they're enrolled in and just kind of the, the nerves that they have that are similar to each other's. Um, we have a pretty good interest in events that are either at our office or on one of the campuses, but we get most of our participation online through social media and through our virtual student union, which we're going to talk about next. We created the virtual student union for students to have a place to go to make connections. We have a pretty popular book and cinema club that picks about two or three books throughout the semester to read and discuss. They pick books that have a movie component so we can stream the movie at some point during the semester and we use Twitter to discuss the book. Books we have used in the past are Silver Linings Playbook and Argo and we use Swank to, st to stream the movies um, to students who are in the book club. The students are given access to the movie through Blackboard and we watch it at a set time and date and then we use Twitter to kind of discuss the book and carry on that conversation throughout, um, throughout the movie. The current book they're using is The Perks of Being a Wallflower. And when they're making the decision about the book, the student, the student life specialist um, checks Swank to see the options so they can combine the book and the movie. And the students get pretty into it. We also have fantasy sports that our students um, get pretty excited about. We have had good luck with fantasy football in the past and students are pretty interested and are able to keep it going um, on their own. We have discussion boards in the VSU so it's similar to discussion boards in Blackboard or any other forum that we may have um, and we can post um, thoughts and feeds and students kind of keep it going and they get pretty competitive with it um, and it always helps that we can have some prizes at the end um, so that definitely keeps the conversations going throughout the seasons. And if I could just add real quickly about the Virtual Student Union. We are in the process of reviewing um, the Virtual Student Union because we want to upgrade the um, activity level within the Virtual Student Union and incorporate some virtual conferencing software that so we can host some live events with large numbers of students. And we think that that is going to really open up uh, a lot more opportunities. But we've gotten good feedback from the students who have participated in some of the things within the Virtual Student Union that Katie's going to go into more detail about. But, you know, our online intramural sports program, as I like to call it, where we have um, the fantasy sports that students can 
sign up and compete against each other and even some staff members as well uh, has really been successful and the students really seem to enjoy that. And these are things that students oftentimes are doing on their own, but it gives them an opportunity to do those types of things with folks that they're going to school with online that they don't really know and help to build some of those connections that Katie was talking about earlier. Um, okay, great. So in um, the VSU, we also have a section for interest groups. And this is where stu students can start and join clubs. And they can post questions to the group. So it works similar to a discussion forum where students can interact and respond on their own time um, and keep the conversation going. And lately, um, we've had some interest from students about creating a group for students with children. So this is the first group that we've had um, in the last couple years that we've been working on this. Um, we've kind of started the interest groups, but this is the first one that students have come to us and said, this is a group that we're interested in. And we've had several students um, mentioned this, so it's something that we're working on getting started and have a couple students who are really working on um, getting this group started within the VSU. Um, so this is really cool for us to actually see the students um, getting involved and kind of taking the ownership of um, the club on their own. Um, like Preston was mentioning, the platform that we're using right now is called is through WordPress. Um, this was the initial program that we set up just to kind of see the flow of the VSU, um, to see how it went, to see the participation, um, what kind of worked well and what maybe we would need to do differently. And now we're working on moving it into phase two, um, integrating a new platform and kind of seeing where we can go with it. Um, we don't necessarily want another place for students to have to go and log in, remember usernames and passwords, that kind of thing. Um, but we're definitely growing out of the WordPress platform, and so we're looking to move on to um, something that we can kind of make our own as well. Um, since we work with students at a distance, we wanted to create a program um, that students could connect with each other, but also create a sense of belonging to the student, to the school. So the, for the past three fall semesters, um, we've provided students with a common reader book to create a um, common experience. Okay, sorry. Um, this year we selected about 500 students through the online orientation to participate in the program, and we used the book No Impact Man. We created a blog where we posted thoughts, quotes, pictures, videos, and started discussions, um, and we used the Virtual Student Union as a hub for more discussions on the topic of the book. Um, no Impact Man turned out to be a really interesting book for us because we got a lot of um, feedback from students. It was kind of a book that they could pick up and kind of read different sections of it. It wasn't something that they had to um, sit down and use the whole thing. Oh, you want that? You want me to that, please? No, did <laughs> okay, something that we knew we wanted to try this fall was having a Google Hangout to discuss the book and connect with students. Um, we hosted the live Hangouts and gave students the opportunity to chat about the book and connect with um, each other through their home. Um, this was something that we got from the Book and Cinema Club. They've been using Google Hangouts and have had um, really good turnout and feedback from um, the Google Hangout platform because it's something that they already have access to through their Gmail accounts through the school. Um, so they're able to just log in and create a Google Plus account and have the Google Hangout there. Um, so um, we got that idea from that group. And we had a couple, I think we had three Google Hangouts for the fall semester for the Common Reader program. And just had really great discussions, but it was a really good opportunity not only to discuss the book, but also to check in with the students and say, OK, you're two weeks into your class. How's everything going? Are there any general questions that you have? Um, and they can kind of talk to each other and say, um, kind of see where they're at with um, their classes and um, you know, if they're coming up on a 
on a test what you know what they're going to be looking for as far as the um, how to take the exam, not necessarily the subject matter of everything, um, because we do get a wide variety of classes that come to events. But just the um, however things work, so they can kind of talk things out before they go in. Um, and then usually we have two staff members on the Google Hangouts just for technical issues, one, but also um, just to kind of keep the conversation going. We also co-hosted one person on um, one event, one in-person event on campus, um, where we worked with the student life at one of the campuses as well as the um, campus environmental group. Um, so the three of us were able to co-host an event and bring the author to campus. And this was tricky for us because we really wanted to make sure people could take advantage of the programs from anywhere in the world. So no matter where they were, um, they would be able to access um, the program, the discussions, anything like that. But we did um, want to take advantage of this opportunity to bring him to campus. Um, so we were able to record the presentation and make it available for students who weren't able to attend. Since we used the orientation population, we had a majority of first year students in mind. Um, but the, they range in age, um, all ages, some returning to school after several years, some taking a mix of online and on-campus classes, um, some taking online courses only. In the orientation, we do market it for new to online program, but we do get students who have taken online classes before. So that's why I kind of say we get a mix. Um, not all of them would necessarily be first time online students, but majority of them are. We also had a good mix of full time and part time students. So we planned the program with non traditional students in mind, and we wanted to create some social media outlets that they could take advantage of from anywhere. We've talked to a lot of students who've gotten a lot out of the book and talking with their peers. Um, but most importantly, it just kind of gives them the opportunity to chat with their peers, um, make connections, kind of give them a sense of belonging to the college um, so that they can kind of feel that comfort before they start their class or as they're getting started in their courses. Um, for the first two years of the program, we tried to run the program for the entire fall semester, but we definitely saw a cutoff after about the first six weeks of the semester. So this past year, we ran a six-week program. Um, we definitely saw the, the comments and participation tapering off towards the end, um, but we had really good involvement for the first couple weeks. So as people were getting more involved in their courses, um, we definitely saw it tapering off. But the six-week program was a great opportunity for us to run the program, um, kind of set goals and deadlines for us. Um, and we were able to use the different platforms to kind of keep it, um, keep it going throughout the first six weeks of the program. We have a team approach when it comes to our social media outlet, um, outlets. And we're definitely not recreating the wheel when working with social media. We want to go where the students are and provide them with information on the social media networks. We use Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and then we also have a blog. And we use the different platforms in different ways, but generally we want to provide students with tips for success in engaging ways. We don't have an overwhelming amount of followers, but we do get a pretty decent amount of participation, um, especially through our contests and trivia. We try to make things creative by adding fun facts, trivia, opportunities to win prizes. And we basically just want to be um, where the students are so that they can feel connected and get the information there. This past fall, we participated in National Distance Learning Week. And we really wanted to celebrate students who are enrolled in the online courses, but also make information available to students who are interested but not sure if it's right for them. Um, we had trivia throughout the week and had webinars for students to get some more information about online programs. So whether they were um, already involved in online classes, there, were, um, there was a webinar available for them. But we also had a Furthering Your Education with Eli webinar for students who are thinking about taking online classes but just aren't sure if it's a right option for them. Um, we do about a 45 minute webinar that gives them good information about um, prospective students and what people um, should look for if they're interested in taking online courses. We were able to mail out some prize packs to students who participated in the trivia, so that always helps kind of spark the interest in helping um, or in helping them kind of 
answer some questions along the way. But we did get a pretty good um, participation in the trivia throughout the week. We want to provide students with some visuals, some fun ways to get information about our services available to them. We use pictures and memes as often as we can to encourage students to learn about our services. All of our ELI courses require at least two proctored exams or assignments, so we tend to get a lot of questions from students about how to take exams. Um, one way is to use ProctorU, which you can take your exams from home. So this meme was something that we just put out on social media to kind of get their attention, but also give them some more information about ProctorU if that was something they were interested in using. <laughs> yeah, and if I could just add, you know, <clears throat> our students are inundated with emails for various um, announcements, information, deadlines, and, and things like that at the college. And, and we know that students don't check their email as frequently as they should. And we want to make sure that we are sharing information with students in a way that won't be just easily ignored or, or overlooked. And so whereas we used to send out just posts and announcements that would say, you know, remember to check to see if your course exams are available through ProctorU because the students do have to take proctored assessments. We want to make sure that we send things out that will get their attention. And uh, we tend to get a lot of, of positive feedback from some of these. And, and uh, so these are just a few examples of ways that we communicate information to our students uh, beyond just sending emails or other types of things that are often overlooked. Great, thanks, Preston. So this meme here um, we put out when we were trying to promote the OER classes. Um, since the OER program is new for us, um, we wanted to let students know about open educational resources and let them know about the courses that were part of the initial program. So we used this meme to let students know um, about the program. Um, and of course, when we put these memes out, we give a little bit more information so it's not just the picture, um, so they can kind of read a little bit of about it as well. Um, but just to get their attention to kind of be something different and visual um, up on the, on the social media site. And then we use this one. Um, some of our students also take classes on campus um, and use EY courses to round out their schedule. Or if a class is filled on campus, they're able to take a, they might be able to take a class um, online. But a lot of our students are out of the area as well. Um, so we just use this meme to kind of let students know, or if students are thinking about taking an online course, this might be um, a good way just to kind of remind them that, that ELI classes are available to them. So again, it just kind of helps break up um, all the reading that might come through on their Facebook feeds or something. They can see a picture. OK, now I'm going to pass this back over to Preston. Great, so these are just some examples of how we reach out to our student population through social media and other means uh, to share information. And these are just some tips for institutions who are doing this um, that it's really important to know what the social media uh, outlet is that you are using and how to best use that particular outlet. Each outlet may have a different student population uh, or a demographic of student that uh, uses that particular social media. And so sometimes you have to tailor certain messages to the different social media outlets instead of just sending the same thing out through multiple channels. And by doing that, you're reaching more students than you might think because there's not necessarily uh, complete overlap of the folks who are following you on Facebook, following you on Twitter, and other types of things. But there may be some very distinct uh, groups of students who are using those uh, outlets exclusively or, or are very involved in those things. And we want to make sure that we're reaching them. Um, and less is more. If you inundate people with too much information, um, then they're just going to get tired what? of it. And that information fatigue oftentimes causes 
folks to miss out on important information or events and things like that. And so we try to send out a couple of posts um, so that we are engaging our students, but we are not turning them off, so to speak. Um, and we have multiple staff who are involved in the process. And so you're not just getting the same type of information from the same person's perspective, but you have a group and the creativity generated by a group of folks is always uh, a little bit better than what one person may be able to come up with. And so having that collaboration has really helped us come up with some events that have been very well uh, attended and, and have, we've gotten very, very positive feedback on from some of our students. And again, just be balanced. You know, we, have, we do a lot of other things, and so we don't want this particular program to take up too much time or too many resources, uh, but we want to make sure that we are staying involved with our students. We're inviting them to participate through platforms that we are providing, such as our virtual student union, but we are reaching out to them where they are and where we know that they are already spending their own time, like Facebook and Twitter and other types of things as well and help to guide student connections. Make sure that you're, you're sharing things with the students that, that help them understand how to interact more, uh, more effectively, but also in a, in, you know, be safe and, and not overly disclose or put themselves in any type of jeopardy when they are interacting with people on social media. So we try to set a positive example for students and, and hope that they will take that and help their sort of digital footprint be something that is much more positive. And so basically, that is an overview of what it is that we are doing at NOVA to reach out to our online students. And I wanted to make sure that we had time to address the multiple questions that I expected because when I presented uh, at the uh, conference in Denver, uh, there was a lot of, of questions, but there were also a lot of folks who were sharing some of the things that they were doing as well, which I thought was good. But I also wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity to keep the conversation going, and so I wanted to invite anyone who would like to, um, at the conclusion of this webcast, to continue the conversation on Twitter. We've had very good success with this type of thing in the past. And so if you want to ask questions at the, uh, after the, the webcast is, is finished or you want to share things, um, dialogue with other folks who were in attendance, um, use the hashtag NovaELife on Twitter. And we will be more than happy to uh, answer questions and, and share what we can. And uh, hopefully other folks who are in the uh, virtual audience here may be able to do the same. Great. Thanks so much, Preston. I think we should go ahead and answer all of the questions as we have time that were presented in the chat box, just so we have them available in the archive. There's some really good questions. So I'll... Oh, absolutely. I'm sorry. Yes, I, I didn't mean to imply Oh, no. Anything. I was just looking at the lengthy <laughs> list I have here. So if we can get through them all, that's wonderful. If not, I'll send them out to you and Katie and have you complete the answers. But like you said, if, if there's any follow-up, let's take it to Twitter. There's some good discussion already taking place there. So scrolling up through the list, the initial group of conversations are about orientation, so those are probably directed at Katie. The first one is from Webster University. What percentage of new online students participate in the orientation? Um, compared to our entire population of students, it's probably not a lot. I have about 1,200 that come through orientation a semester. Um, it's students self-select in. So I saw a question about be it being required as well. So I'm going to kind of cover that as well. But I meant to pull up my numbers this morning. But since I'm home, um, I'm not able to access my file. And I knew this was going to be a question. But so I'm, my numbers are going to be kind of rounded out. Um, but we've gotten up to about 1,200 that come through um, the different sessions, whether it's um, they participate in the live session or they contact us and get the recordings. Um, I do send out recordings to um, everybody who who contacts me and asks for it. We also have a, a um, 
link on the website. So if they know they can't come to any of the sessions, then they can request a session. I obviously want them to come live so that they can get the full interaction, but I don't want to keep the information from them as well. Um, so if they're going to listen to the recording, great. Um, you know, I want them to have the information. So we put that up there. Um, actually, we've just started putting the recording link up. I think we started doing it last spring, so we've done it for a full year now. Um, and then we've gotten some huge numbers from students requesting recordings, because it's just something that they can do um, on their own time. And um, we I'm don't, I apologize, oh, sorry, Katie. I just wanted to, to add that um, it's, it's about $1,200 a semester, 1,200 students a semester who are going through the orientation. And I know that there was a, a, yeah. a question, I believe. Um, I, I can't follow the, the chat very well, but I can occasionally see when one pops up um, about the requirement for orientation. And orientation is not required, as Katie mentioned, students do opt in. Um, and we do uh, make sure that students are aware of the orientation, and we give them uh, many opportunities to participate by offering uh, multiple sections prior to the start of the semester. But starting um, next fall, uh, we are going to require orientation for new to college students aged 18 to 24. This is a college initiative that we're trying to do. Um, and so what we will be doing is when students are, are admitted to the college, it, they will be identified as being part of that new to college uh, 18 to 24 demographic. And those students will have to participate in orientation, either a live orientation at one of the campuses or one of the orientations that Katie does for online students. Um, but just that particular population of student will be required to attend orientation. For the remaining students, um, it is optional. And um, with the self-selection in, they the students that we get are um, the students who are kind of like going above and beyond, like they're signing up for the orientation, they're coming to the orientation, they're, um, you know, they would they would do it regardless of whether it was required or not. They're the ones that are kind of like the, um, you know, the students who are probably going to persist and do pretty well in their course anyway. Um, so. With that being said, I did see a question about um, like how we find like if they do better in their courses than students who don't come to orientation. I have run a few um, um, inquiries with the person who does some data with our students and just to kind of see. Um, but it's really hard to compare since it's not required. Um, to see how students are doing, if they're finishing their course or not. Um, and I haven't had much luck of like really finding out a lot of details in that matter, but that's definitely something that I want to kind of do as we grow as a program. When we started doing this um, orientation three years ago, I've been in the position three years. When we started three years ago, um, we were just happy to get people to come to the session and to stay the whole time and to ask questions. Um, and now we're getting to a point where we're offering a lot of sessions. We're having um, 200 people sign up for sessions um, and coming to the sessions and asking tons of questions. So we have more people added, more staff members added um, to help us kind of monitor the chat and go through everything. Um, so we're definitely growing as a program. And that's the um, data to see like how they're doing in their courses, definitely something that we want to add in the future of seeing how they're persisting in their course. But because I do a lot of follow-up with them, I get a lot of feedback from students, and um, I do some surveys and see how they're doing with their courses. So in that respect, like when they actually respond back to me, um, I get some good feedback from that and can kind of change up the program and see what, um, what I should add to the session and what they need more detail of um, and that kind of thing. Great, Katie. I'm going to move us right along. Another question was, who conducts these online orientations? Are advisors, faculty, student support specialists, are they involved? Yes. So I run um, the kind of the student service instructional service side of it. And then our support service, our Blackboard support services um, specialist does the Blackboard overview. Um, so I start it. She comes in and does about a 15-minute overview of Blackboard, um, and it's kind of a fast 
run through of everything um, that you would need to know to kind of get started in your Blackboard course. We show a sample course um, and kind of run through all the kind of that, the general what you may see in your course. Um, and then I get back on and talk about testing and um, services that are available. And then, so the two of us are the speakers on the session. And then we have um, the student life specialist helps with the chat. And um, sometimes we have a couple other staff members get on and help with chat and just help with answering questions at the end. So usually there are at least three of us on. Wonderful. That leads me to the next question. So 24-7 chat support is available. And so who manages that? We, during our normal business hours, our staff at Eli uh, are the ones who are uh, handling the chat. And so our student services staff rotate with um, shifts covering the chat. And then for after hours, uh, we have the, um, we are able to outsource the 24-7 uh, chat for the overnight hours. Um, so we're able to provide those folks with information. We also have our IT help desk that can, can um, provide assistance if it's really technically related questions for students. But we find that um, it really works well because we get a good number of students who are participating in the chat during our regular hours, but um, being an online program with students um, not only all over the country, but we have folks you know, from other countries who um, may be enrolled in some of our courses, we need to have that availability uh, when they are online and, and have a question that needs to be answered. Great. And from Mira Costa College, do you find you have a lot of non-online students that also participate in the virtual student union? I've moved us past the orientation. I would have to say that the, the student participation is primarily for the students who are uh, online, maybe not exclusively, but taking a a significant number of online courses through ELI. <clears throat> there are a lot of activities that the campuses offer, and campus students oftentimes form uh, bonds with, with organizations or groups or, or, or folks that they uh, are seeing and interacting with on campus. Um, and so while we certainly don't exclude folks um, from the campuses to participate, uh, we would find that a vast majority of the students who are doing the uh, program are enrolled in online courses. They may not be exclusively taking online courses. They may also take courses on campus, but they are uh, enrolled in at least some online courses through Eli. Okay, the next question is about student activity fees and how they're used for these virtual groups as well as campus clubs. Can you use the same activity fees or are your online programs funded differently? Um, all of our students pay the same tuition and the same fees, regardless of whether they're taking classes on campus or online. And so we get a portion of the budget for student activities um, to provide these types of um, opportunities for students uh, who are taking online courses. And so we do not charge separate fees for those students. Um, we are operating within uh, a small but budget, but, but something that at least gives us the opportunity to tailor some, some things for our particular audience. Okay, and I'm sure a question that many people are curious about the answer. For the WordPress platform that you use for the Virtual Student Union, there was a question about whether you could share the name of the add-on that's used. Uh, I don't know. I, I, maybe Katie knows that better than I do. Um, our, our student life person uh, runs that, and, and we could certainly get that information for someone if they wanted it, but I do not know off the top of my head. Do you know, Katie? I don't know. Um, I know Amanda would know, though. We can get that to you to send out. 
Excellent. Thank you. The next group of questions is around the Common Reader program. There's a couple questions about if the Common uh, Common Reader book is across all programs and how successful this initiative is. Is it uh, was it pretty popular or did it take a while to get some traction? Yes, um, we it has taken a, a while. Well, we've done it three semesters and we've seen it grow each semester. Um, we we use the orientation population, so we just select the, basically we kind of go with the first 500 people that sign up, but we, um, um, oh my gosh, I totally lost my train of thought, sorry. <laughs> we, we start with the population, so it is very widespread of whether they are enrolled in all ELI courses or if they're in campus courses as well. Um, so, and part-time, full-time, age range, um, we pretty much just kind of do a random selection from that very beginning of who's signing up for early orientation sessions. Um, the first semester we did it, we didn't get a great turnout of people participating in the blog. We were able to check the, like, who was checking the blog, and we saw a lot of traffic coming into the blog, but we were not getting a lot of um, of participation. The next semester we used the Henry Adel the Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, which is a really interesting book, but it's heavy. Um, so we got a good solid group of students who were participating and um, they were kind of our core group. I'd say we probably had about 25 to 30 students who were consistently commenting and um, doing majority of like the the publishing on the blog. Um, which isn't a huge percentage if we send it out to 500 people. Um, but it was like really, we were, we were really happy with it. And then this last book we used, the No Impact Man. And we were probably a little bit more than the 25, 30, but not much. But with that one, it was a lot um, easier because we could get students who might not necessarily be reading the book, but the topics were, you know, something that you could kind of comment on and have an opinion on, you know, how you um, live a sustainable life or what you do with your, um, how you live, you know, resources and um, so we got some pretty good comments with that and we also tried to make it more interactive using videos. Um, we had some staff members make videos. Um, we encouraged people to send us pictures and we had a Eli garden. Um, so we tried to make it a little bit more interactive. So we had about um, the same amount, maybe a little bit more than that 25 to 30 um, group. Great, and I know a lot of people are thinking that they'd love to get something like this started at their institution, and they're having questions about the financing and the structure of staff. It sounds to me like, at least for the orientation, there's three to four of you really involved. Um, but to implement these programs across the board, all of the ones that you've highlighted here today, how many staff members work on the program and are they included in departments across student success programs at the institution? Do I need to rephrase the question? Oh, it looks like we might have lost Preston. Oh, yeah, sorry. I was waiting for Preston to answer that. Um, but it looks like, yeah, he must have gotten kicked out. Um, as far as the staff working on it, we probably have about um, eight staff members who are across student services and then also including the two librarians that we have. So probably about six student services and the two librarians um, working consistently on it. Um, it definitely is a program that we need um, the extra kind of thought process going into it because we try to publish at least three blog posts a week. Um, so how we did this past one, which was the first year that we did it, was we split it up by weeks. Um, so with the eight of us, we split it up in six weeks so that we were able to kind of just focus on um, different topics. So it wasn't one person trying to come up with all kinds of different blogs throughout the first six weeks of the semester. Um, so we split it up that way, um, kind of by theme. Um, as far as the funding, we did use an outside, um, we had money from an outside um, kind of pool of money. We didn't use the student service or the student life money for this, um, but student life did get involved and we did a couple of things with the student life money. Um, 
but we did have an outside pool of money, and Preston would probably be able to answer that a little bit better as far as budget. Um, so he, maybe he can send that information to you of how we did it. But it's definitely grown over the last three years, and we've put a little bit more money into it as we've grown. Yeah, a lot of schools are using the Common Reader, so we thought this would be a really good way to kind of something that we could do with students not necessarily being on campus. Um, the blog has worked out really well for us just to kind of get people, so it's not something that they have to do at specific times, um, but still something that they can participate in. And we see a lot of people just coming and reading, um, so we're able to kind of go through and read those analytics and see who's coming to the blog and how many um, site visits it's getting. Um, so it kind of gives us a little bit of encouragement that way. Well, great. We have so many wonderful questions, and we are running out of time. I want to get to one question that was asked out on Twitter from Kelvin Bentley. He asked, does NOVA see online student engagement as design targeted for all students, or is it more geared directly toward online students? Um, OK, if I understand that correctly, we just work specifically with our online students. Um, the six campuses have programs, orientation programs. They have um, student life programs that are focused on students on campus. And the EOI students can take advantage of anything that happens on campus as well. Um, but this is specifically for our online students so that they can um, kind of feel that sense of community from wherever they are. Great. Well, I'm going to move us along pretty quickly. And as we mentioned before, take the conversation out to Twitter. And I have the questions all compiled. I'll make sure to get them to our wonderful presenters, Katie and William, and we'll get responses out to you, along with the link to the archive. Learn more and stay connected with WCET. We are doing another webcast on March 13th, and that's a big audacious conversation with two competency-based education leaders. So you can learn more on our website, start registering for that. <coughs> Membership is uh, a wonderful way to get involved with the com community. We have very popular news digests, active listservs, the free webcast, and exclusive member-only resources. And Put it on your calendar to join us November 19th to the 21st in Portland for our annual meeting. Additional information, as I mentioned, we'll have all of these resources not only emailed to you, but posted on our website. Thank you to Blackboard Collaborate for making the platform available. I'd like to thank our supporting members, Boise State University, Colorado State University, Dow Lonis, Lone Star College, Michigan State University, Mizzou Online, University of North Texas, and University of West Georgia. They really help support our activities. And our annual sponsors, Cengage, CourseSmart, Pearson Learning Solutions, and Vital Source. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you to our wonderful presenters. And we look forward to seeing you at future WCET webcasts and events. I'll leave the chat room open for a little bit longer if you want to add questions here. Thanks, everybody.